highlight everyone. I, I, I think that I have the responsibility of calling folks to order to start our next panel. I have nothing to bang but a water bottle. There we go. So it, the, one, one of the great things is uh, for all of this sort of cross-fertilization and, and conversation to be happening. Um, so I, I start this again at the risk of cutting that off or at least delaying it uh, a little bit until um, uh, late, later in the day. Um, my name is Jennifer Lorne, uh, and I'm a professor of law here at University of Texas, and I have the enormous honor of, of moderating this um, conversation about assessment of the uh, American death penalty, uh, in which we'll talk a bit about um, not just what, what we know about the American death penalty and how we know it, but also sort of why it matters what we know what we know, right? Uh, in, in what sense does that sort of assist us in, in, in packing, unpacking um, some of the puzzles uh, of, of, of Greg. Um, uh, with me, um, I have four uh, un unbelievable uh, authorities in this area, and their bios are extensive in the program. Um, I'll just sort of introduce them b by name and a teeny bit about their relevance to this particular conversation um, in the order in which they'll, they'll be speaking. Um, starting us off is going to be Professor Sam Gross uh, from the Univers University of Michigan School of Law. Um, among other things, uh, Sam is one of the, the leading uh, empirical researchers on the criminal justice system and the death penalty more specifically. And for those of you who have not uh, uh, explored in depth um, the National Registry of Exonerations, of which he is the editor, uh, I, I strongly suggest that you run, not walk, uh, to explore that uh, amazing resource uh, about exonerations over the last um, two decades. Um, Seth Miller will be uh, following Sam on the panel. Seth is executive director of the Innocence Project of Florida, chair of the ABA Death Penalty Death, uh, uh, Due Process Review Project, and among other things has been a, a, a researcher at the ABA um, at the inception of the ABA's uh, state assessment projects, and we'll be uh, speaking to that. Um, uh, next to Seth uh, is the, the Honorable Mike Wolf. Um, currently dean of the St. Louis University School of Law, uh, but he assumed that uh, post after serving 13 years on the Missouri Supreme Court, during which time uh, within the state of Missouri there was an ABA-sponsored assessment um, which uh, he will address in terms of uh, his, his view on that from the court and now as a continuing player in the conversation about the death penalty in Missouri. Um, and finally, Professor Carol Steiker uh, is a professor of law at the Harvard Law School. Um, she teaches uh, widely published on uh, topics in criminal law and the, uh, the death penalty, as we've already uh, heard and many of us know today. Um, but also in 2009, um, she and a, a co-author, also named Steiker, uh, uh, released a study on the American death penalty, uh, which was commissioned by the American Law Institute that was influential in the withdrawal of the capital punishment provision of the model penal code um, and in the capacity of, of that assessment she will be uh, discussing uh, her work with us today. Um, uh, so the, the panelists will, will speak and then I will uh, sort of exercise some moderator's privilege in starting off our conversation before more moving into a more open Q&A. Um, so let's uh, start off with, with Sam Gross. Okay, thank you, uh, and it's great to be here. Uh, uh, I have a PowerPoint, that one, one. <laughs> and I'm also standing, which I gather is unique for this panel. So, uh, uh, and the reason for both is that I'm supposed to uh, go through a whole lot of, a whole long list of things really quickly. Uh, this is basically designed to be a summary of a bunch of issues uh, about the death penalty on which there has or can be a systematic uh, uh, empirical study. Uh, this is not a list of everything interesting that we could study about the death penalty. Uh, uh, it doesn't include anything, for example, about lethal injection or mental illness or God knows how many other things. Uh, also, uh, with apologies to lots of people, some of whom are here, I'm not going to mention the names of any researchers as I rush through the research at top speed. That would take too long. Uh, and I'm going to move as rapidly as I can, counting on what has been apparent uh, so far today, which is this is an uncommonly well-informed audience on this topic. 
So, uh, what are the issues? I have them in categories here, and uh, most of it, but not all of these, are issues that came up in some form or another in Greg and before that in Furman. And the first category are the uh, benefits and costs of the death penalty. The initial one, and the one that consumed a huge amount of effort in the Furman and Gregg litigation was the question of the deterrent effects of the death penalty. That is, does the death penalty deter homicides more than alternative punishments, in particular life imprisonment? Uh, uh, as an as a li uh, issue in litigation, that one has basically uh, died an unceremonious death and has not been resurrected since 1976. The Supreme Court basically said we're not interested in this and nobody's really challenged that. As an empirical issue, it's lingered. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it's important because uh, if somebody managed to convince the court or other people that the death penalty does have a substantial deterrent effect, that would be an extremely strong argument for the death penalty. Uh, that has not happened. Uh, uh, the last word on that is a study the second by the uh, commission by the National Academy of Sciences in 2012 which found that the death penalty excuse me that there uh, that the available uh, empirical information does not support uh, a proposition that the death penalty has a deterrent effect or indeed uh, disprove it uh, I, I think that's accurate I think it's actually too modest a statement I think a, full, a better statement would be that the empirical evidence uh, does uh, not support any indication that there is a deterrent effect of the death penalty and does show that if there is a deterrent effect, it is very small. Uh, it cannot exclude the possibility of a small deterrent effect, but I think it already excludes the possibility of a deterrent effect that's big enough to matter. Uh, in any event, it's not an issue there. Uh, in the background, I mentioned two other possible costs or benefits of the death penalty that were, of course, central. Uh, in the formative litigation on the constitutionality of the death penalty. Uh, on the one hand, uh, retribution, which is now the uh, dominant justification for the use of the death penalty. Uh, and on the other hand, the inhumanity of the death penalty, or whatever else the basic moral arguments about the death penalty are described as, uh, neither of those are empirical issues. Uh, uh, I'll get back to them briefly at the end of this short piece. Second, uh, out of order. There's the question of how much the death penalty costs in terms of money, uh, you know, dollars and cents. Uh, and then a more complicated and more difficult question of how much the death penalty costs in opportunity costs. Uh, things that people or institutions could have done if they weren't occupied dealing with the death penalty. Uh, the first, the issue of money has been studied repeatedly. Uh, there's some very good studies on it in a few states uh, and there's lots of uh, less coherent but uh, very persuasive evidence that we all know that the death penalty is very expensive. Uh, this uh, was not, I think, widely understood back uh, in the 1970s, although it was becoming, coming into focus. A lot of people still don't know that, but the death penalty is obviously much more expensive than not having the death penalty. Uh, and the opportunity cost part of that is probably the greater one, but much harder to study and I think uh, has not been adequately studied. The big issue for new research on this question, on uh, this uh, general topic, costs and benefits, is the cost of convicting, sentencing, and possibly executing defendants who are innocent. Uh, that was described as an issue in Furman and Gregg, although not as a central uh, issue in any of the opinions. Uh, we now know much more about it. Uh, we have, because of the uh, extraordinarily good by American standards quality of data that we have on death sentences and the very high number of uh, death penalty exonerations. There are 156 that are listed uh, on the uh, site of the Death Penalty Information Center since 1973. Uh, uh, we uh, now know that uh, uh, we can estimate the rate of false convictions among defendants sentenced to death in the United States since 1973. It's uh, at 4.1 percent, which is uh, surprisingly high, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, has an implication that is sometimes overlooked, which is that even though we know of 156 people who have been exonerated after being sentenced to death, uh, this estimate implies that the majority of innocent people who were sentenced to death in the United States in that period have never been identified. 
that they've either died of other causes or remain in prison or in some cases certainly have been executed, but we don't know who they are. Um, I'll say one more thing about, uh, about uh, this issue, uh, innocence. Uh, here too, uh, an issue that's not yet uh, uh, fully explored, the pervasive issue of race and race discrimination in the criminal justice system shows up again. Uh, African Americans are 42% of those who have been sentenced to death in the United States since 1973, uh, and 53% uh, of those who uh, uh, were exonerated uh, in that period. That's, those figures, that's actually not from the Death Penalty Information Center, but from the numbers in the National Registry of Exonerations, but I imagine they're extremely similar, uh, which is a, a, a sizable difference but the real difference is almost certainly larger. One of the things that uh, you see if you look carefully is that the African Americans who were exonerated and released spent more time between conviction and exoneration than the whites uh, uh, by several years. That means that there are more of them in the pipeline. That means that there are more who haven't yet been discovered. And we see that because the actual the proportion of African Americans who uh, among those who've been exonerated from death row has been increasing over the past several years. Uh, second, second big one. As I said, I'm rushing. Uh, <laughs> patterns of use. Okay, well the big one here of course is discrimination. And by that I mean overwhelmingly racial discrimination, uh, an issue that is deeply familiar to everybody here. This of course uh, was uh, litigated in the case of McCleskey uh, McCleskey versus Kemp, based on a uh, on a uh, uh, landmark study by, I'm going to break my vow, David Baldus, a researcher <laughs> whom I will mention by name because he deserves it, uh, uh, not like all the rest of us who don't. Uh, uh, it lost, but it's been very influential. Uh, the realization that the use of the death penalty in the United States is deeply affected by racial discrimination, in particular discrimination by race of the victim, but also discrimination by the race of the defendant, is now widespread. Uh, and it has probably contributed a significant amount to the power of the uh, uh, opposition to the death penalty. Arbitrariness, a much more general uh, issue. Uh, that means a variety of different things. I've mentioned only a few of them here. One is uh, simply chance that those who were sentenced to death and who were executed are hit by lightning, or whatever the phrase you want to use are, is, uh, as opposed to selected because they particularly deserve it. Uh, it's closely related to the issue of proportionality review, which was talked about uh, in uh, the first panel this morning, what, uh, what that uh, appeared to mean in Furman and the truly minimal, if not non-existent version of it that uh, turns out uh, it really means in Zant. Uh, that's one type of, uh, 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 one type of uh, arbitrariness. There is a good deal of information on this from the study that David Baldus did in Georgia and from many other studies since then that have been done on racial discrimination and on arbitrariness, on patterns of the use of the death penalty in other states and other periods of time. They show various things in terms of detail, but they all show that in addition to a uh, almost universal pattern of discrimination, by race of victim and a very common pattern of discrimination by race of defendant, that the death penalty is not consistently used against the worst of the worst, but used against people who are unlucky uh, for whatever reason, including geography, uh, being in a county where uh, death sentences are much more likely to be charged, or being in a county where juries are much more likely to impose them, or because of their representation, their legal defense, where uh, we have heard in uh, some detail how much of a difference that makes for reasons that have uh, nothing directly to do with the wrongfulness of the conduct of the defendant. Uh, time on death row. Uh, a little history uh, as one of the white-haired people in the room. Uh, how many people here remember Carl Chessman? Okay, about a third. Okay. Uh, he was executed in 1960 at the age of 38. At that point, he had spent 12 years on death row. That was considered uh, an atrocity. 
the idea that someone could spend that long on death row and be executed after that long a period when he clearly had shown that he was a very different person by that time than he had been uh, at the time he was uh, sentenced to death was a major argument against the death penalty in 1960. Uh, in 2016, a couple of months ago, Brandon Jones was executed in Georgia at the age of 72. He'd been on death row for 36 years. Uh, didn't get very much attention. Uh, I'm sure a bunch of people in this room noticed. I suspect others didn't. Uh, the amount of time people spend on death row has grown in a way that is hard to describe. Uh, the way it's, uh, what's happening with it in California now can only be described as surrealistic. Uh, and uh, the consequence is that there were, at the time Furman was decided, 642 defendants on death row, and that was considered a monumental buildup and a major reason for the successful strategy of presenting this issue to the Supreme Court in that form because the justices didn't want the blood of 600 people on their hands if they said the death penalty was constitutional and this huge backlog that had built up behind the dam was considered a major asset for the defense. Those days are long past. We've gotten used to thousands of people on death row spending dozens of years there. What it does to them, whether it's unconstitutional or violates international treaties and other reasons I won't get into, but the, but, but the meaning of it, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the size of this change is huge. Last, acceptability. Uh, uh, this is you know, what ultimately has become the major issue in the use of the death penalty going forward. And the Supreme Court uh, has mentioned various things. I'm going to go through very briefly. State laws, well, you know, you'll hear more about that if you don't already know. Uh, as of 2005, 38 states had the death penalty. Uh, 10 years later, it was down to 31. There has been a decrease. There's been a much sharper decrease in the use of the death penalty. Uh, again, no news to you. Um, in um, 1996, uh, there were uh, 315 death sentences in the United States. Uh, 20 years later, there were 49. That's last year. Uh, in 1998, there were 98 executions in the United States. Uh, 18 years later, there were 28. Uh, the, the numbers uh, uh, that uh, you know, uh, spell out how the death penalty is used on the ground show a, a very steep decline. And that, to some extent, par parallels the last issue I'm going to say anything about, which is public opinion on the death penalty. I'm sure you've seen some version of the general picture on the death penalty, which is you know, publicized every year or so by Gallup, my least favorite uh, public polling organization. Uh, but they've been doing this for longer than anybody else. Uh, and what they show is that on the question they asked, support or opposition to the death penalty, support went down from 80% to 61% between 1998 and 2015. And opposition went up by someone more, uh, from, uh, from 17 to 37%. Um, we, we can tell to some extent by asking people why they favor or oppose the death penalty, uh, what's uh, driving these changes, because we have uh, data on that from some studies, not uh, the Gallup studies, but the General Social Survey, which is a much, much better survey. And, uh, uh, we see a couple of very likely patterns. First, that rising questions about the accuracy of the death penalty, in particular the uh, obvious fact that many innocent people have been sentenced to death and later exonerated, and the likely fact, the inevitable fact that some innocent people have been executed, uh, has reduced support for the death penalty probably more than anything else. Uh, in effect, what's happened here, in some ways, is that if asked for their, the reason for their position, opponents of the death penalty, who back in the old, old days, which is to say early 1970s or 1960s, would cite, uh, uh, would cite uh, normative moral reasons, because it's inhumane, because it is in inappropriate, because it is barbaric, typically cite utilitarian reasons because uh, it doesn't deter uh, and because there's a danger of executing innocent people, and that more than anything. On the other side, those who favor the death penalty, which is still a majority, 
substantial majority, uh, are much less likely to cite utilitarian reasons, in particular deterrence. Uh, that has become a minority position for people who support the death penalty, and much more likely to cite uh, normative reasons, in particular retribution. And then there's one last issue, which I'm going to uh, mention, which uh, has some support, but it's hard to measure and much uh, less systematic. And that is that there seems to be a change in the level of intensity in support for the death penalty. Uh, the numbers I've uh, mentioned, the ones on polls that say, are you in favor uh, or do you oppose the death penalty for persons convicted of murder or something like that, uh, that is a good measure of change over time because uh, questions of that sort appear to be answered in the same way regardless of the exact wording and they basically answer the question, are you for it or are you against it? And that's it. Uh, but they don't tell you how much you care. And as far as we can tell from some surveys and a lot of other information, it looks like those who favor the death penalty care a whole lot less than they did 20, 30 years ago. And if I had to guess, I would say it looks like those who uh, oppose the death penalty care at least as much as they did in the past, uh, which is a good sign perhaps, but uh, as we heard this morning, uh, predicting is a bad idea, especially about the future. <laughs> okay, that's it. So I'm going to talk about something a little different. Um, I'm going to talk about the ABA's state assessments of uh, death penalties uh, administration in those states. Um, at the time that the ABA passed the moratorium resolution in 1997 and then created what was then uh, called, unfortunately called, the uh, ABA Death Penalty Moratorium Implementation Project, which is a mouthful um, since changed our name, uh, we sort of recognized that there wasn't much in the way of comprehensive, you know, full system evaluation of the death penalty system, and particularly uh, not much in the way of state-specific assessments. So from 2003 to uh, 2013, uh, the project with generous funding from the EC, from the European Commission, and others uh, embarked on a series of really comprehensive, thorough, full system assessments of the administration of capital punishment in 12 states. And over that time, we split those into two waves, the first wave being uh, first Florida and Georgia, and Alabama, Pennsylvania, um, Tennessee, Ohio, Indiana, and Arizona. And then the second wave coming in the latter part of those 10 years being Virginia, Kentucky, Missouri, and Texas. Um, you know, the whole idea of these assessments was to give those jurisdictions um, a, an objective instrument to be able to evaluate their death penalty systems and sort of compare them to benchmarks that the ABA had created through the policies that over many years that the ABA adopted related to the criminal justice system and particularly um, the administration of capital punishment. And in 2001, the ABA adopted, they took all these policies and put them in what they called the ABA protocols on the administration of capital punishment, and they revised it in 2010. And that sort of became uh, our metric for what we were going to compare uh, what states were doing to sort of the ABA aspiration, what you, we would need if we were to have a fair administration of uh, the death penalty. Now, in terms of our methodology, what we did in order to accomplish this, um, we recognized that for whatever reason, people have different views of the ABA, but we really wanted to make um, these assessments have, as they should, the kind of local uh, feel that they needed to have legitimacy and be a real tool in the states after they were completed. So we put together uh, state assessment teams, and these were uh, diverse assessment teams of people within those states, judges, prosecutors, people at attorney general's offices, uh, defense attorneys, academics, um, other social scientists who are into demographics. Um, really a di diverse group of people who could stud uh, study this issue. And we used researchers on the ground in those states, students and other volunteers, as well as the ABA staff at the project, which I was a part of at that time, to uh, gather really anything under the sun that would help us answer these questions. We collected and analyzed ver uh, various statutes and rules and procedures and standards and guidelines related to uh, the administration of capital punishment. 
And all of this, um, oh, and we also we made an effort, the protocols themselves weren't really um, in a digestible format, so what uh, the folks who were in charge of the project did at that time, they translated the protocols into what we call the assessment guide, which um, was then given to uh, the assessment team and those researchers to help them better gather the information that was gonna be necessary uh, to do these assessments. Now, the ABA protocols, they covered really a wide range of areas, really from uh, soup to nuts, everything that we would think of should be in a comprehensive assessment. And there are really 13 main areas, and those in our big reports, and you know, I think there's a Texas report out there on the table, you can see it. Um, that is our 13 chapters of the, our assessments. And they split out, I'll just uh, tick them down so you can understand the comprehensive nature of these reports. Uh, they were uh, death row demographics, including the evolution of the state's death penalty statute, as well as uh, location-specific information, and Misty can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there was three or four states where we did actual demographic studies and uh, uh, race studies in those states. Um, second chapter was about the collection and preservation of forensic evidence, particularly DNA evidence. Uh, third, we looked at law enforcement tools and techniques, issues related to eyewitness identification and false confessions and the like. Um, crime laboratories and medical examiners, um, issues related to the prosecutorial function, and then issues related to the defense function, all the way from trial through uh, post-conviction. Uh, issues related to uh, direct appeal and the unitary appeal process, as well as uh, post-conviction and how that uh, state post-conviction dovetailed with uh, federal habeas. Clemency, jury instructions, the independence of the judiciary, racial and ethnic bias, and then also uh, we did a chapter on uh, what was then called mental retardation, and uh, in I think all but the first, the earliest of the assessments, uh, we looked at mental illness, because at the time we started the assessments, the ABA hadn't finalized their, uh, their policy or their standards on mental illness. Now, the assessments themselves, um, as you can imagine, when we were done assessing, we put together these huge, huge reports, um, we looked at this very objective information, what was going on in the states, and we characterized it in one of five ways. Um, either the state was in compliance with the ABA protocol, they were partially in compliance and we tried to be generous where we could. Um, they were either not in compliance or there, or there wasn't sufficient information to, uh, to figure it out or um, the protocol wasn't applicable in that state based on their laws. Now, um, when I talk about insufficient information, different states have an uh, easier or harder time getting information. Uh, and so like for in Florida, for example, really great public records laws, we were able to get everything we would ever need to answer these questions. Um, in some states, far more complicated. And what you'll see, if you were to look at all these reports, in the states where it was more complicated to get information, smaller reports, uh, more information, uh, bigger reports. Now, it, it shouldn't surprise any of you that um, out of the uh, originally 79, but then it expanded to 93 protocols, uh, very few of those protocols are the smallest uh, number of protocols were in compliance in all those states. Okay, like in Alabama, there were four of the, of the 79 that were in, uh, in, they were in compliance, not very many. Most of this ended up in the either partial compliance, non-compliance, or not enough information. Um, so, you know, there was a, it was very clear from the assessments that there was a lot of work to be done, a lot of voids uh, that needed to be filled. Now, of the states, um, most, recommended uh, uh, suspension of executions, moratorium on executions, and Georgia, the Georgia assessment team, and again, it was the assessment teams that decided whether they were gonna do this or not, um, not the staff at the ABA, but the people on the ground. Um, the Georgia assessment team went further and recommended a uh, uh, moratorium on both capital prosecutions as well as, execution, or as executions. So, we have all these protocols in here, and there were you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of recommendations on what states need to be doing. Um, the, in the executive summaries of these were long, really long reports, it was the assessment team themselves, again, this diverse group of people, who were able to decide uh, which recommendations they thought were the most important, and they highlighted those in the executive summary as sort of the, the, the first things or things that we should prioritize doing um, 
if the states were to be inclined to do that. Um, so the question I think that we're gonna try to answer up here is, you know, what is the utility of, of, of this? Is it, does it have utility or is it really an exercise in futility? And um, I would argue, and of course I'm biased because I wrote you know, big portions of some of these reports, but I, I think there's been significant impact by the AB assessments um, in a number of different ways. Uh, we got a ton of media coverage around these um, assessments, both when we rolled them out um, and released them, but also in some states like Florida, Kentucky, we've got continued uh, media coverage. In Florida, we have uh, a, a gentleman who's on my board at the Innocence Project of Florida and also a, a retired Supreme Court justice in Florida, Raul Cantero, who uh, I feel like there's an op-ed every other week um, to the consternation of some, um, in some newspaper in Florida, uh, leveraging the ABS assessment report in Florida um, to get uh, the, the policymakers in Florida to do their own assessment of some part or all of uh, Florida's death penalty system. So um, again, continued uh, media hits, keeping it in people's minds. Um, in Ohio, uh, they've done their own state government study after uh, we had, uh, released our assessment report. We've had citations in many, many, many court opinions um, in states, and really maybe this is the, the holy grail. Um, the, in, we've had governor-led moratoria, particularly in Pennsylvania, where Governor Tom Wolf cited our Pennsylvania assessment report as um, one of the many bases uh, that he relied on to uh, make that decision. Uh, in Missouri and Kentucky, um, there's been legislation proposed uh, related to the recommendations and the assessments, and uh, assessment teams continue to advocate, and uh, Judge Wolf will talk more about that, particularly you know, these assessment teams, even though the assessment process is no longer um, you know, in motion, some of these assessment teams have stayed uh, uh, constituted, if you will, and are doing things like authoring or signing on to amicus briefs or advocating for legislation or uh, reforms of court rules within their states. And I, I think one of the other really important impacts of the ABA assessments is that they give uh, actors within the system a good sense of what the voids are in these states, um, per particularly other people in who are doing research, but also litigators who can use um, these voids and, the, and these problems as uh, things that they can base on their litigation on. Uh, which of course is really important. I know in a place like Florida, uh, they, with, the, with mixed success, the AB assessment in Florida got a lot of mileage from uh, capital post-conviction litigators um, who wanted to use the findings in the report um, as a way to get back into court. Now, I, I think one of the main strengths of the AB assessments uh, was first that we used these on the ground people. It, wa it wasn't just something that came out of Washington, D.C. Or Chicago, the ABA office in Chicago is really authored with staff support by the assessment teams in those states of really well-respected people. And, and the other thing too, there wasn't any editorializing in here. I mean, it was really as objective as one could possibly be. What's our protocol? What are the facts? And you make the call on compliance. And in that way, these assessments were uh, factually unassailable. I mean, I, I can't find anyone who says something we did in the assessments was wrong, uh, basically the response is similar to what Jeb Bush said uh, when we released the Florida report, are you gonna take any of these recommendations? And he said, nope, right? And so, but, but and, and that's unfortunate, but again, um, th th this tool is unassailable. No one has argued that what is in these reports um, I is wrong or mischaracterized or somehow um, you know, being used for nefarious reasons. Now, um, and of course, you know, we use these uniform uh, standard metrics, which I think is a, is a great hallmark of the reports. Now, of course, the weaknesses of, of these reports is that they're, they're so goddamn long. I mean, you know, I, they take up like two shelves. I have them all on, on of my thousands of books. I have them all in there, and they take up, you know, two bookshelves of space. And, um, and because they're so long, they're not easily digestible. Um, and, you know, when you're trying to get policymakers to to say, here, look at all these problems, and, and, and you need to fix them, and you hand them a 450-page assessment, um, you know, they're like, are you kidding me, right? <laughs> so, um, so I don't know how you get around that problem when you wanna do a thorough, comprehensive assessment, but it's a, it's a problem nonetheless. 
Uh, we also, uh, because we took on so many assessments over this period of time, it's a, it's, it's a big deal to do one state assessment, we did 12. Um, we had limited funds to really, I think, leverage the, the rollout of these assessments to, to do real, you know, hire PR firms, do, do real media pushes that could have um, maximized uh, uh, you know, what we gained from uh, rolling these out. And so you know, if we had maybe had to do it over and we had unlimited money, we would have done things maybe a little differently. Now, just in terms of where we're going with the AB assessments, it's, it's not, at this point, it's not part of our portfolio of things that we're doing. We have, a, we have at the more, at death penalty due process review project, we have clemency project, a serious mental illness project. Um, but I can tell you that uh, Misty and I and, and others on the steering committee are interested in really doing two things going forward with the assessments. Um, there are a number of states that we left out uh, uh, for various and sundry reasons. Uh, most notably Louisiana, that I think deserves assessment. And, 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 but also, we're 10 years out from the start of these assessments. The, the Florida report, uh, the, the Georgia report came out in 2006. Uh, there's a lot more to say uh, to be current and accurate. So I think, you know, as we move forward, we're going to be looking for partners to be able to um, update our assessments so they remain viable and remain accurate and current, as well as uh, taking on um, a few new assessments in some key states that really need uh, the assessment. Thank you. I, uh, <laughs> I want to follow on that, just a couple of introductory uh, comments about this. Um, you saw Catherine Case's uh, thing about death verdicts this morning. I don't have my own slide, so I'm just going to refer to hers. <laughs> I went on the Missouri Supreme Court in 1998, and they were, we were way up there as Texas was, and then they kind of went down like this, and about the time George Ryan was letting all those people off death row in Illinois, we went down to about zero death verdicts for one year, and it sort of creeped back up a little bit. So it's a, those, those charts, I think, look uh, fairly sim uh, similar. Um, when I started in 1998, I had no uh, prior experience in uh, criminal law other than I tried a traffic case once. Um, <laughs> and, and so this was kind of news to me, and I was, uh, you know, uh, we were, had a whole, a lot, quite a lot of death penalty uh, business then, and I was uh, in a vehicle with uh, uh, five of my colleagues, uh, and I was the only one who hadn't been appointed by John Ashcroft, so we were probably a little bit different culturally. Uh, and there was a death case on our dock the next day, and somebody said something about it. They said, yeah, well, that won't take much time. And I said, well, you know, I've actually read the briefs in that case, and I don't know if that guy did it. They said, and one person said, well, you can't dissent. You won't get retained. I thought, well, what kind of a job is this? So <laughs> uh, I did dissent. The guy's name is Danny Wolf. He's still in prison. Uh, uh, the second time around, I had more votes, and we gave him a new trial. Uh, he got life without. Uh, I was, I'm still the one in 13 years that I really thought probably wasn't even in the neighborhood. But uh, So when the assessment uh, proposal came and we were in the second wave, uh, it, I was still on the court. I wasn't on the court when, when you finished uh, the assessment. That's how long. Uh, you know, and, and I think it was a very thorough uh, job. We had some bad convictions, obviously. I don't think that's uh, disputable. Uh, despite the, in more recent years, uh, death penalty cases in Missouri were tried by public defenders who were capital specialists, but the public defender system in Missouri, as in a lot of states, is uh, wildly un underfunded. Uh, the other thing that we had, of course, is a strange pattern of uh, death penalty sentences. Um, I have to give you a quick lesson in M Missouri geography. What we used to say when I was in state government for a brief time in the 90s was, take away St. Louis, take away Kansas City, what you got is Arkansas. <laughs> or the shorthand is, we're Arkansas with Major League Baseball. <laughs> um, so a lot of the uh, differences in terms of race uh, you're more likely, as a, as a statistical matter, to get the death penalty if you're white, uh, only by virtue of the fact that in rural areas where most of the 
victims, the defendants and the jurors and the judges are white, uh, they're much more likely to do that, or they have traditionally been. And in urban areas, particularly Kansas City, Jackson County, which is an urban uh, county which includes both suburbs and inner city, uh, you're much less likely to, uh, to have the prosecutor recommend uh, the, pursuing a, a death sentence. In St. Louis City, the same thing is true. St. Louis City is the inner city of St. Louis. There is a, an entity called St. Louis County which surrounds the city and it's suburban and it used to be uh, mostly white. Now it's uh, getting a little bit more uh, mixed. But what you have then is a pattern uh, detected in an earlier study by uh, uh, some professors too from St. Louis University and one from Washington University who studied charging decisions around the state. Uh, in St. Louis County, the suburban county, uh, the prosecutors in intentional homicide cases sought the death penalty 7% of the time. In Jackson County, it was 0.5% of the time. Now, that reflects two differences, three actually. The beliefs of the prosecutor, uh, the composition of the juries, um, and also the, the race of the uh, victim. In, um, informally, although nobody would ever acknowledge this, in the city of St. Louis, for example, the prosecutor probably won't seek the death penalty if the vic unless the victim's family asks for it. And if the victims are African Americans, oftentimes they are, they're not, inter they're not that interested in the death penalty as, as a matter of preference, and we talked about that in terms. And the other reason, of course, is that many of the jurors will be African Americans. In St. Louis County, the suburban county, as African Americans moved out of the city and into the county, what we had is in the phenomenon that I noticed in the 13 years I was on the court is that most of our Batson cases, almost all of our Batson cases, came from St. Louis County. Um, and it goes back a long ways. I had a colleague uh, on the, uh, at the St. Louis University faculty who later became a Supreme Court judge in Missouri prior to my being there. But years ago, he used to do uh, briefs for Attorney General Jack Danforth in criminal cases. And he said that the, the uh, notion in St. Louis County at that time was leave one. That was the, that was the uh, rule for the prosecutors. In other words, leave one African American on the jury so it doesn't look like you're discriminating. Um, and, uh, and so you have that kind of pattern. The, so the other uh, thing that besides that are the, uh, the inexactness of the definition. Uh, it's hard really to tell the difference between first and second degree murder if you read the statutes when you understand that the jury instruction and the law says that uh, a first degree murder is one with deliberation and the period of deliberation no matter how brief. So one of the first cases I remember when I was on the court we had a guy who was about to be executed um, and there was a last minute habeas which is actually one of the good things that we do. We, we don't we, we have re repetitive habeas uh, petitions, that's fine. Um, but they were attacking the deliberation. And I said to my colleagues, and the same ones who were in the car with me that day, <laughs> have you ever seen, this guy was, killed this guy in a bar fight. I said, have you ever seen a bar fight? Well, there's enough people from the Southern Baptist Convention there that they probably actually hadn't. Um, <laughs> but I said, it's all testosterone and alcohol. There's not even the briefest of deliberations there, but uh, the man was executed anyway. Um, so we have that the we have 17 aggravating circumstances as as you as the assessment team found as they were examining this, which means that almost all of the intentional homicide cases could be charged as death cases uh, because they're going to fit some aggravator. Uh, I think vile circumstances or something that usually. Uh, covers everything. Um, so you, what you have uh, then is sort of a 95% uh, I think is the figure that, that uh, we've noticed of cases that are intentional homicides. The prosecutors don't seek the death penalty. Uh, in the 5% that they do, 2.5% get a, a death verdict and the other 2.5% don't get a death verdict. So it's um, uh, so the question is, does it sort out? Uh, 
So the assessment team, the ABA assessment team, which is headed by a professor from St. Louis U and a professor from the University of Missouri, and I, I think it was a good representative group from around the legal profession, uh, studied this very intensely. Their um, report, which I think was released in 2012, March and April, uh, was about 400 pages long. Uh, mercifully, it does have an executive summary of about 40 pages, so you can see. And when you were telling about which ones were completely in compliance, I hadn't counted it up. But Alabama only had four. We beat them. We had six. <laughs> or we were fully in compliance. So uh, when the report was um, delivered in 2012, I, um, I had left the court in 2011, so I had to go back and backtrack about this. Uh, it, you know, it gets assigned to various committees because that's how courts typically function. We have a committee that, that studies jury instructions, for example. Uh, some of them were uh, recommendations directed to the legislature. Well, getting the legislature interested in revising the death penalty statute, I'm sorry, they're kind of worried right now about wedding cakes and gay marriages to, to be worried about something as trivial as the death penalty. So uh, good luck with that. The one area where it really did have an impact was in the, eye, in the eyewitness identification issue. Um, and that was referred to a uh, committee on procedure in criminal cases. Uh, one thing about the court's committees, by the way, is that unless you know somebody who's on one of those committees, you can't find out who's on the committees. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't want people to be bothered or lobbied or something like that. I didn't find that out actually until I had left the court that I said, I wonder who's on that committee? And I looked all over the website and I thought, hmm, because I have to ask. <laughs> so uh, I can still ask. Uh, I don't know how long that lasts. I don't know what the shelf life is of being able to ask. But, but in any event, they came up with, a, a, with I, what, I, what I thought was a very good uh, eyewitness uh, uh, instruction. In, in the process of putting it out there for comment, they got some serious pushback from some, a judge in St. Louis and uh, some judges in Kansas City who were uh, conservative about this because in Missouri, as in many states, Judges are, trial judges are not free to comment on the evidence, and they considered some of the uh, eyewitness identification uh, to be a comment on the evidence. Um, the, uh, the, so the court was thinking about that. Around that time, and this was in 2015, uh, and, and by the way, it just takes a few years to get things done. I mean, when courts do make changes, they, they tend to make them at sort of Vatican speed. Uh, you know, take a century here or a century there, what's the difference? Uh, but, the, uh, um, but the upshot of that is that the, in the meantime, the Eighth Circuit, which is not known as a bastion of liberalism, came out with a really good eyewitness instruction, which was just about the same as what the Missouri court was proposing, and I think it was helped by the fact of the decision in Perry versus New Hampshire, which is cited by our committee and the, uh, uh, the jury instruction committee in promulgating it. Uh, so I think the court in effect said, well, if it's good enough for the Eighth Circuit, it's good enough for us. So it went into effect January 1st of this year. So oh, four years, whatever. Um, a second thing that I think is really going to revive some of the things that are in the assessment report, uh, and, I, and I mentioned to Seth uh, uh, that when I was looking this over again, we have now, uh, you've probably heard of Ferguson. <laughs> There's been a fair amount of intensity about the look at what the criminal justice system is in our state. Uh, so that, uh, and I don't know whether this is, a, we have, they have a commission of 40 persons, thankfully I'm not on it, uh, on racial and ethnic fairness uh, to see what we should do. Uh, and I'm not sure, sometimes I wonder, you know, when, when people set up commissions, whether that's a kick the can down the road exercise or whether, you're, uh, whether you have some seriousness about it. But what I did was, I, when I was looking through this, I thought, well, there's a whole lot of things in this assessment about race. So I sent them the report. And I said, hey, you gotta look at this. Because I think most of them have never heard of it. One judge who was on the commission sent me back a thing, and I, and I said, Read the executive summary. It's only 40 pages. She said, 
She said that she was looking forward to reading it, but maybe not the 400 pages. Um, the, uh, so, the, but the big one in here, it seems to me, that still needs to be resolved is that business about aggravating factors, about the, uh, whether this really sorts out the worst of the worst, and, and I don't think you can make a case for that. Uh, but one of the things that I think that, that is gonna be helpful uh, following up on that is that there is a, a group of researchers, uh, the principal investigator is Ray Paternoster, and uh, who's done some other uh, research. There's a couple of researchers that work through our uh, clinic at St. Louis University, uh, and they have some law students, and they have some volunteers from the United Kingdom, because what they found in Missouri is that there is a data set that is quite wonderful, because in 1977, when the legislature reinstated and did the post-Greg statute, the, there's a requirement in there that the trial judges, where there's uh, death penalties, fill out an extensive report in the form of a questionnaire. And so the court has 19,000 pages, uh, which these researchers consider the richest data set uh, for empirical capital sentencing research. But what they need to do is they need to go back to the courthouses in the in the counties where there are non-death cases and compare those. And so they've got these people going around the state. They've got good cooperation from the uh, Committee on Judicial Records. Uh, they go, they show up with their scanning thing, and they scan the files of every uh, homicide case uh, in that same period of time. Um, the questions I think that they need, that they, they will be addressing, and I think that they're, this is really a good follow-on from the assessment, and that is, first of all, does the scheme for intentional uh, homicides, specifically these 17 aggravating factors for capital murder, narrow the scope of cases eligible for the death penalty to only the worst of the worst? I mentioned that. The second one, and actually I think it's their first issue, but I think it's, 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 they're, they're equally important, is Missouri's imposition of the death penalty influenced by constitutionally impermissible factors such as the race of the defendant, and or the race of the victim, and B, these intra-jurisdictional variations that are based upon geography. Uh, so they've had this, they've got this broader study uh, going on, and, uh, and as I say, uh, what I think that they're finding is that if you're bent upon uh, homicide in the state of Missouri, uh, and you're taking a random walk or a random drive through the state to figure out where you should do your homicide, you should be very careful. Uh, there are some counties uh, where you're in uh, the Confederate South. There are some where you're in the buckle of the Bible Belt, and you are some in urban areas where you'll look kind of like an eastern city like St. Louis or a midwestern city like Kansas City. Uh, or you can be in suburban St. Louis County and watch out uh, because that's, uh, uh, that's got a much higher rate of being charged. So I think that, that, the, uh, that this will allow at least some real look uh, at this uh, that, that uh, could have an effect uh, in, in cases to be decided. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, that this process, coupled with the further look at the narrowing factor of, of, of aggravating factors will be useful uh, and, and benef beneficial. So I'm going to pivot and um, away from the ABA. We've heard quite a bit about that on this panel, as is only appropriate given the role of the ABA in, uh, in death penalty assessment and in organizing this terrific uh, conference. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, an assessment done by the uh, American Law Institute, the ALI, which is probably the country's premier bipartisan legal think tank. In 2009, the American Law Institute, the ALI, took the unusual step of withdrawing its own model death penalty provisions from the model penal code that it had promulgated uh, more than four decades previously. And the ALI took this step based on a report that uh, it commissioned from my brother Jordan and me. 
What was unusual about this decision to withdraw the death penalty provisions of the model penal code uh, was that this was the first hair on the head of the model penal code that had been touched since the code was promulgated in 1962. So 1962 to 2009, that's a long time to leave the model penal code untouched. And this was the first change that was made. Um, it will probably not be the last. As many in the room know, there's a current uh, project underway to reconsider the rape and sexual assault provisions of the model penal code, which are um, quite outdated, drafted as they were in the 1950s. And there's also a more general sentencing project uh, underway, both of which are, are being considered on the floor of the ALI at, at its annual meeting um, next month, and, well, May, whatever, this coming May. Uh, so what I wanna do is give a little bit of background of these provisions how they came into being and how they were withdrawn and to talk a little bit about the significance of that decision. So the ALI, as I said, is one of the most influential law reform organizations in the country. It's probably best known for its work in producing the restatements of law in various fields. In the mid 20th century, when the ALI turned its attention to criminal justice, it looked around at state criminal codes and it judged them just too irrational and chaotic to permit restatement of some consensus area of law that it could say was kind of the heartland and rational coherent core of American criminal law. It just said can't be done. The states need more help um, than a restatement. We're gonna give, we're gonna promulgate a model, a model penal code. We're gonna create from scratch a coherent rational approach to criminal liability. As we heard earlier this morning from Mike Meltzner, Herbert Wexler, one of the giants of criminal law scholarship of the 20th century, professor at Columbia Law School with the gravelly voice, I can't do it the way Mike did. Um, he, was the head he was the reporter, which means the director of this project, the Model Penal Code Project. And for quite a number of years, from the sort of mid-late 50s to 1962, when the council and the body of the ALI approved and therefore promulgated the model penal code as, as its work, um, the ALI worked on this project. At the time when they got to um, murder and, the, and capital punishment, Herbert Wexler, as Mike told us, was at that point quite opposed to um, the death penalty being part of this model code and the group, the committee that he had to work on the model penal code project, which was 20 people, voted on whether they thought the death penalty should be part of the model penal code and they voted 18 to two against it. But the bosses of the ALI then and today is, are, is the council, everything to be promulgated by the ALI has to go through the council as well as the whole body of the ALI and the council told uh, Professor Wexler that they did not think that the ALI could be influential on the issue of the death penalty. This is now in the early 1960s when more than 40 states and the federal government had the death penalty and worried that if the ALI were to recommend against the death penalty, those 40 plus states would just ignore the model penal code because it you know, ran so against this um, practice that was deeply embedded in their law. So they told Wexler, forget about it. Um, we want to model death penalty statute from you. Um, and Wexler's project did create a model uh, death penalty statute, which you would all find very familiar. <laughs> um, the model death penalty provisions of the uh, model penal code said there should be two parts to the criminal trial. There should be a guilt phase and there should be a sentencing phase. And that after conviction at the guilt phase, the sentencing, the sentencer, which in the MPC could be either a judge or a jury, should find at least one from a list of enumerated aggravating factors. And then they should consider all relevant mitigating evidence and weigh the two against each other and should um, uh, decide whether the death, death was a, a warranted sentence. This was very different from death the prevailing um, capital practices at the time, uh, pro at the time that in 1962 when the MPC was 
um, promulgated by the ALI. Most states did not have bifurcated proceedings. The jury was uh, asked in the same pr proceeding to decide whether or not the defendant was guilty or not guilty and to render a sentence. And they were given nothing in the way of what should be considered. Instead, the standard instructions to capital sentencers, sentencing juries was, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you may sentence the defendant to death or to life or to sometimes a term of years. And the choice among these options is in your sole discretion. It is according to your conscience. And there was no other guidance given to sentencing juries. So this was a big change. Um, in the model, uh, model penal code. And the model penal code provisions, you know, were the model penal code was received with a great deal of fanfare, but the death penalty provisions of the model penal code sank like a stone, completely ignored by the 40 plus states that had the death penalty. A few of them bifurcated. That was the one potential influence that you could see in the 1960s. I think like five or six states bifurcated their proceedings that had not previously. But other than that, completely ignored. Until the LDF got on the scene and began its capital litigation campaign that led to the uh, court's uh, decision in Furman. And at the time of Furman, the, you know, the lawyers for the state of Georgia argued to the court, as they had successfully the year before in Magotha versus California, that it was just impossible for state legislatures to come up with um, uh, capital sentencing statutes that guided jury discretion because it was just impossible to say ahead of time what the relevant considerations would be in any meaningful way. And the court replied, what do you mean it's impossible? Those pointy-headed guys at the model penal code did it. Surely you could do it too. You're, you're not even going to try. So um, when Furman came down, uh, in the four years between Furman and Gregg, 35 states passed new capital punishment statutes, many of them just basically cutting and pasting with the model penal code. Um, and in 1976, when the court upheld three of the death of the five cases it considered, struck down the mandatory statutes and upheld the three guided discretion statutes in each of those cases, Furman versus Georgia, Profit versus Florida, and Jurek versus Texas, the court compared the statute that up, it upheld to the model penal code and said basically this either looks like the model penal code or is functionally like the model penal code and therefore it's okay. Fast forward to the late 1990s, early 2000s, the, the ALI started this new project which Judge Wolf was involved in um, the, and remains involved in, the sentencing project where the, the uh, the ALI is considering some sort of new sentencing provisions that would be added on to the existing model penal code. And Frank Zimmering, who was an advisor to that project, he's a professor at Berkeley, said, we have got to reconsider capital punishment. We've got the sentencing project going on, and our last project, the model penal code, was basically the template for the modern American death penalty. We've got blood on our hands, and we have a duty to say whether we think that that prior intervention was a successful one. But the sentencing project of the model of the American Law Institute said, you know, actually, we're just not we're not going to deal with capital punishment right now. It's just not part of our agenda. Zimmering was so upset he quit. Um, not the whole ALI. He quit the project. Um, <laughs> But that was not the end of the question. Two other members of the ALI who are very involved in capital punishment stuff, familiar to many people in this room, Roger Clark and Ellen Podger, moved on the floor. Anyone can make motions in the annual meeting happening in May um, of the ALI, and they moved um, that the institute, the ALI, is opposed to capital punishment. Well, the ALI's response is what its response is to always, always to everything is they formed a committee to study it. Um, that committee was headed by my brilliant late colleague, Dan Meltzer, who um, has been very involved, was very involved in the ALI. And eventually what the committee recommended and the director of the ALI did was commission a report on capital punishment in America from um, Jordan and me to advise the ALI on what it should do in response to this motion that the ALI is opposed to capital punishment. 
We um, wrote a long report, it's like 50, 60 single space pages, um, uh, not 500 pages, <laughs> so, so it was like the, the length of an, the executive summary of the ABA assessments. Um, we recommended not that the ALI should say it is opposed to capital punishment because that sounded like a moral judgment, which the ALI has no particular expertise in, but we recommended that the ALI should um, recommend against the um, call for the rejection of capital punishment as a penal option based on, and here's our language, current intractable institutional and structural obstacles to ensuring a minimally adequate system for administering the death penalty. It's basically on procedural grounds, the ALI, because that's what they're experts on, should say that there are irremediable problems in the administration of capital punishment um, and that therefore uh, they should recommend that states not use the death penalty as a penal option. Huge debate, they, amazingly the ALI gave this one hour of debate on the floor. The debate lasted for three hours on the floor. It got very impassioned and ultimately what the ALI ended up doing was cutting the baby in half. They cut out the language that we suggested about them uh, recommending, uh, calling for the rejection of the death penalty, capital punishment as a penal option. Instead they said, we withdraw our own support for our own model penal code provisions based on the, that may, they used our language, um, institutional and structural and institutional obstacles to a minimally adequate system for administering the death penalty. As Adam Liptak translated for the general public in the New York Times, he said the ALI is saying that the American death penalty is broken and it cannot be fixed. Um, the report that we wrote had eight different parts and it had all the things that you might think would be in there, discussions of cost and of counsel and of innocence and of race. Um, but, uh, uh, and of the sort of politicization of the death penalty. But what was critical and what I think is most interesting and what I wanna emphasize um, about this moment is the most striking thing about what the ALI did is what it did not do. So the ALI like prides itself on being the go-to place for your tough policy fixes. You got a tough legal problem, take it to the ALI. It'll take them a decade or two, but they will <laughs> fix it for you. They will appoint committees and committees after their committees and committees to committee those committees and review those committees and they will come up with, you know, booklets almost as long as the ABA assessments that will <laughs> fix your legal problems. And what the ABA said in its report, withdrawing the model, death, model penal code provisions is, we do not, we recommend against a law reform pro project in this area, which is what we had recommended against. Um, and in our report, we gave three reasons why um, the ALI should not take on um, a, death, uh, a death penalty reform project. One is the ABA had been doing this for years and had promulgated all of these um, protocols and best, best practices and on top of all the a ABA's work and their studies, many states had commissioned their own self-studies of their own death penalties and many other NGOs like the NAACP and the ACLU had done a lot of death penalties. There's more stuff out there um, than uh, had, could even be indexed, much less had been um, listened to. That was, and then number two, there was just no indication that there was any political will in the states to care or listen. I love, if I had known about um, Jeb Bush's nope comment, that, that like kind of summarizes it, you know, are you gonna do anything about this? Nope. So that was reason number two, is there was no interest in the states in doing it. And reason number three was the things that are most broken about the death penalty really can't be fixed by a law reform organization. So the fact that 90% of American judges are either elected by partisan political election or stand for at least some kind of election, retention election, and the fact that most American prosecutors, it's very hard to explain this to Europeans, prosecutors are elected as well, right. the intense politicization of capital cases 
is not something the ALI can fix. Um, similarly, the, the high cost of the death penalty, which is a product largely of constitutional rules that the Supreme Court has imposed on the American death penalty, isn't something that can be fixed. And they're just, when states are struggling to pay for roads and schools and healthcare, to say that they should also spend a lot more money on lawyers for people who commit the most horrific crimes imaginable, there's no political will for that. So the resource problem is it's sort of insoluble too. And something that the ALI and the smartest lawyers in the room, who I like being described as the smartest lawyers in the room, by the way, um, uh, <laughs> can't fix. And so as we said in our report, I'll read you the line about what we said. We said, you know, uh, if the Institute, upon reflection, concludes, as this report suggests, that the administration of capital punishment is beset by problems that cannot be remedied by even an ambitious reform project, the Institute should say so rather than invest its own time and resources and the hopes of reformers in a project that will not succeed but may delay the recognition of failure. And the fact that the ALI was ready to say, we're pulling our own work and we're not gonna invest a minute of our time in trying to do a better job is I think going in retrospect to be a turning point um, in kind of the, the assessment world. I will point out that the assessments are important because the Supreme Court has said they're important. The views of expert organizations, footnote 21 of Atkins versus Virginia, the views of expert organizations are part of what the Supreme Court says courts should consider in um, evaluating Eighth Amendment challenges to capital punishment. And in fact, the ALI's decision was cited by Justice Breyer and Justice Ginsburg in their dissent in Glossop versus Gross. Interestingly, beyond the constitutional rubric, it's also something that quite a number of state legislatures are interested in, as they, uh, there have been you know, many hearings since 2009, and Jordan and I have taken turns testifying in various state legislatures about the ALI's work. So clearly, the ALI is still a voice that state uh, lawmakers are interested in hearing from. So I will, I will end there so we have some time for questions. Great. So I, I want to make sure to leave time to, to open it up, but I, I wanted to just start by asking one sort of cross-cutting question or, or, or maybe more accurately try, trying to sort of um, invite maybe commentary on the panel to, I, I think in a way, a, a sort of challenge that's posed uh, by at least one version of, of understanding Carol's, Carol's remarks, and that's, you know, what's the, what, what's the aim here, right, of trying to achieve some further understanding of what's going on in the American death penalty? I mean, there's, there's one way in which, um, you know, if you sort of contrast the ABA report and the, the report to the ALI, the difference is not just in, in magnitude, right, the, the volume of the thunk, um, but the entire approach, right, the idea that there is in the ABA report a sort of chart and a sense of whether you've made it, right, which implies maybe if you didn't, maybe you could, right, and so the invitation is to sort of fix it, um, uh, whereas, right, you know, on Carol's account, the upshot from the ALI and, and should be, you know, not doable, right, in, intractable, um, and I wonder, you know, should, should we see, you know, the data as, you know, usefully being marshaled in service of, you know, that I illustrating the intractability, um, a point that I think Danny Lynn Reeser made earlier, right, lawyers sort of illustrating the intractability. Um, is there a risk that, that the assessment process, that the data becomes sort of inevitably a kind of preservation um, tool uh, rather than the other, and, and how do we avoid it being that. Yeah, well, in defense of the ABA. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it serves multiple purposes. So I think that there's no doubt that when you look at a 400-page report and you have, out of all the states we looked at at the time, I think Indiana won with 
10 of the 93 protocols in compliance, and, but it was still pretty woeful. It's like having, you know, shooting like two for 10 from the free throw line or shooting three for 10, right? It's it's, it, it all sucks, yeah. right? So um, um, you're, 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 you're Shaq regardless, right? So, um, so I, I, I think it illustrates the point that Carol's making that maybe we're at a point where this is intractable. However, I think the data is extremely important because fixing many of the things that are, uh, the, uh, many of the 93 protocols that we looked at um, while it may not lay the basis for um, an argument that, oh, now we have a working death penalty or we have a system that works, um, many of those things, if fixed, would lead to more reliable criminal justice outcomes and inert to the benefit not only to uh, defendants in death penalty cases, but to all criminal defendants. And those are necessary and laudable goals. They're things that we should be doing. I mean, from when I put my uh, day job hat on at the Innocence, at the Innocence Project of Florida or within the Innocence Movement, um, the uh, out of all the protocols that we looked at in these reports, the things that have had the most success in terms of reform are the innocence protection reforms. Part, I mean, Steve Saloom's here, who was uh, the policy director of the Innocence Project for many years, and um, we've had tremendous success um, getting some of those things in, in Ohio and in, in Texas. Texas is, um, you know, the bastion of progressivism when it comes to innocence protection reforms. I'm so surprised. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and whether that is, whether that is, that's in part because of the great work of folks in the innocence movement, but also um, the, even w well before the innocence movement was organized, the ABA's recognition based on social science that many of these things need to be done, it's not gonna fix the death penalty per se, but um, it, it, it will help lead to more reliable criminal justice outcomes, which is important. I'll, I'll uh, second that. I, I mentioned in when I spoke that I read this with post-Ferguson eyes, and, and that is, what is it about our criminal justice system that isn't working very well? Most of those things that you recommend, they, these states ought to go back and take another look at them, because if you slice it by the effect on ra based on race, you get a whole bunch of other things that, that, that can affect criminal prosecutions generally. So I think the innocence movement and some of this very thoughtful assessment does help. And, and uh, I don't know if we'll get to the point very soon when all the people in this room will be at a wonderful conference talking about reforming the criminal justice system because y'all don't have a death penalty anymore to worry about. That would be a nice day. Is that next year's conference? <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> Probably not, not according to. <laughs> great, um, great, yeah. Evan, Evan is already laughing. At the no, I'm only laughing because Michael pointed at me. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> I, I wanted to ask, um, Sam, maybe you could comment a little bit on, on the empirical case, but I'm interested in, in all of your reaction to how we talk about race. So I was occasioned over the past couple of months to go back and look both at the evidence of racism in the system, but also how uh, the scholarly community and to some extent in making the case to the public, we, we talk about racism. And I, I see a strand, it's not universal, where people sort of say, well, that's not really an essential part of the case anymore. And uh, long story short, Coker really eliminated the most problematic racist application of the death penalty, which was in uh, the context of rape, particularly in the South. Um, and, and I have to say, when I went and looked at the data that I, I felt I had misrepresented often to the students, I always um, very focused on the race of victim effect and sometimes say that there's not really a race of defendant effect. But Sam, in your comments, I thought this was important. Actually, there is substantial evidence of a race of defendant effect. It's not as robust, it's not as pervasive as the race of victim effect, but you know, while Baldus didn't find uh, a race of defendant effect in, in Georgia. He did in his Philadelphia study. The GAO meta study in, the 19, in 1990 found about half the studies. That seems to me it comes up about um, half the time. And, and also, I, I think that this concession uh, that before that Coker undid it, you know, the social science evidence prior to Furman is really, really sketchy. Uh, but best I can make of it, I actually think there's a reasonable case that racism in the most traditional sense has actually gotten worse. Um, and so I'm wondering, with your expertise, what you think about that empirical case, but also whether we've been correct to surrender that point, if that's what's happened. I don't, I'm not really the best person to speak about this, but I can give you a quick view. First, since Coker has come up, 
it has to be mentioned that the most salient thing about Coker is that it found that the death penalty for rape is unconstitutional in the United States and doesn't mention race once. Doesn't mention anything that could get to uh, even give you the impression that there is such a thing as race, that there are people of different races in the United States. It's an astonishing uh, example of uh, the Supreme Court avoiding talking about race in this context, which uh, you and uh, Mike talked about earlier. Um, there's no reason why racial patterns in the use of the death penalty in the United States should be the same from one jurisdiction to another. Uh, many other things about the death penalty are not. The studies of by now, oh, Mike probably knows better than me, but there are probably, since uh, Baldus' study in Georgia, somewhere between 20 and 30 different studies in various states, some, some more than one, some just one, probably a few there, still none. Um, and they find different things. They almost always find race of... Uh, of victim effects, but not always. Uh, uh, they often find race of defendant effects that are generally smaller, but not always. Uh, what to make of that? Well, the first thing to make of it is to understand that the way these studies are done, they're almost inevitably going to understate the extent of uh, racial, dis racial discrimination, because what they do is take racial disparities, which are almost always uh, reasonably substantial before you control for other factors, and control for other factors. And if another factor, for example, uh, um, uh, killing a stranger or something like that, uh, may explain part of the racial difference, they assume that that is the reason for the difference. Uh, and that's done systematically. Uh, it's, uh, it's essential to the argument, uh, because you're arguing that uh, uh, what the state does is illegitimate, and you, to do that, you have to be able to say we've excluded every possible argument on the other side. But by excluding every possible argument on the other side, you're also excluding some of the evidence of race. Uh, and, that, uh, the, and the cumulative effect of that is hard to assess, but it's got to be true. Uh, the second is that, um, and this is a, a, a huge issue in the background, and one that is very complex to talk about, but the reason uh, for not finding race of defendant effects or for some of the limitations on the finding of race of victim effects is uh, uh, accepting uh, the huge disparities in the rate of commission and victimization, uh, uh, a homicide commission and victimization by race as a given. Uh, that's not the product of discrimination uh, in the criminal justice system or in any other, play, uh, in any other uh, uh, aspect of the uh, uh, society that matters to this argument. So uh, African Americans are, I believe, about 43% uh, uh, of those who are uh, convicted of murder in the United States and 13% of the population. Uh, African Americans uh, commit something like that proportion of homicides in the United States and are victimized at about that rate as well. Uh, you can say that's just a given, and that has nothing to do with racial discrimination in any way that matters to the criminal justice system. Uh, and that is typically the way the research is organized. Uh, but that, again, limits any finding of race discrimination. Can I, can I just add to that idea, which is the idea that, you know, there, there are, there's no question from everything we know, you know, uh, discriminatory law enforcement aside, that there's higher offending in, uh, in homicide, uh, higher homicide offending um, in uh, among African Americans, and especially in very poor um, minority communities. And there's a really interesting, relatively recent book out by this uh, LA Times uh, investigative reporter, Julie Ovi, called Ghetto Side. Mm -hmm. And it talks about the incredibly low clearance rates of homicides mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. black and brown communities of um, South Central LA. And makes the interesting and I think indisputable point that high homicide rates in the US and around the world where are, are often the product, are, are a response to weak state intervention. Like if the state does not vindicate deaths, there will be vigilante justice. And this is kind of, you know, back to the Greg idea that there will be lynch mob violence. What there really will be, there will be vigilante violence on, on in communities to respond to, um, homicides that are not cleared by the state. And so that in itself is a, a way in which race discrimination, the lack of investment in detective resources in South Central LA is clearly 
uh, you know, part of an, an under enforcement issue um, in uh, in criminal law that has a long and sad racial history. So excluding that as evidence of discrimination just ignores history. I'll add, I'll add one thing to that, and that is to take race out for a moment. And my anecdotes are 13 years of looking at these cases and quite a lot of them. There are no rich people uh, who are under death sentences. They are all poor. There's a lot of poor whites from rural areas who have death, death sentences. So you kind of take that out as a given, and, and there are no there probably are a few people who, if you were to use an IQ scale, that would be above 100. Uh, but mostly, you know, when you when you look at, and there are a lot of uh, Atkins is still in the mix of, of well, what what counts and what doesn't. I was kind of horrified the other, not too many months ago, when uh, the, my former court authorized the execution of a guy whose IQ scores were 71. Well, and they'd say, well, 70. He's higher than 71, off he goes. Well, uh, that's, you know, that's kind of low. And most, you know, most of them you see, even if there's no diagnosable uh, uh, mental deficiency, there are deficits of various kinds. And so you really are dealing with a somewhat diminished, damaged, and, and economically impoverished uh, population. Uh, and that's basically who you're dealing with. I think we might have time for one more quick question. Jordan? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're deferring. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I have a question. At the time that the uh, ILA, um, the ALA promulgated its, you know, penal model code that included a bifurcated process, uh, was the notion of death qualified or punishment qualified juries uh, part of the consideration? Yeah, in fact, this was pre-Witherspoon versus Illinois, so at that point, um, people could be excluded from capital juries for having what were called any kind of scruples or conscientious scruples about the death penalty. So death qualification practices were actually more extreme in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Witherspoon was until, what was it, 68? Yeah. Um, so Witherspoon, Illinois, limited death qualification um, and said that jurors had to make unmistakably clear that they could not impose the death penalty um, before they could be excluded. That was later modified a little bit, but before 1968, um, you could be excluded for having any scruples. And in fact, in Illinois, they found that 50% of the jury pool was excluded in every capital case um, under that lenient standard. Thanks, well to keep the trains running, I think we have to take the time now to thank our panel. Thank you very much.